folks, Dr. Travis McMacken here. Welcome or welcome back, as the case may be. Thank you for choosing to spend a bit of your day with me. I hope that I can at least help you to think some interesting thoughts. I'll be back with you in a moment after the music ends. I'm back with you today to speak about paragraph 3 in Karl Barth's Göttingen Dogmatics, continuing the series that I've been doing on this volume. And I return to this series um, with some added context. In the beginning of December 2019, I had the opportunity to travel to Hanover, Germany to give a lecture on Karl Barth. And while I was there, I took a quick side trip over to Göttingen, and I was able to walk through uh, the historic part of town. I was able to walk over to the university. And uh, having now returned after seeing some of the material environment where Bart delivered these lectures, uh, it just makes them come alive in an even more compelling way for me. So I'm happy to be back speaking about paragraph 3 Today, paragraph 3 addresses the theme, Deus Dixit, God Speaks. And I'm going to begin, as I always do, by reading the Diktatsatz to you, uh, which heads the section. So here we go with the Diktatsatz. Christian preachers dare to speak about God. The permission and requirement to do so can rest only on their adoption of the witness of the prophets and apostles that underlies the church. The witness which is to the effect that God himself has spoken, and that for this reason, and with this reference, they too must speak about God. This assumption can arise only because they take it that God's address is directed to them as well. It means that with fear and trembling they recognize God as the true subject of the biblical witness and their own proclamation. End quote. The first section uh, or subsection here is called Daring to Speak About God. And Bart really wants to underscore that um, speaking about God is not something that human beings can or would do uh, without provocation, as it were. And I like the word that Bart uses on page 47. He talks about speaking about God as a venture. But Bart, through this section, makes a minimal distinction between preachers and theologians. Um, there's a quote on page 46 that I want to read that kind of gets us into the mindset uh, of those who would speak about God. So, and tells us what a theologian is. Quoting again, Theologians are people who speak about God, we have stated already, perhaps only in a few vague sentences shortly before the Amen, perhaps only as if they were saying, please excuse me if I briefly say something about the main thing. Perhaps in a mystical or orthodox mythological veiling so that people cannot tell whether they really mean God when they say God. Perhaps with all kinds of open substitutions, for example, between God and various other gods. Perhaps to satisfy the linguistic refinement of the declining West, in intentional avoidance of pronouncing the word God, and using instead all kinds of old or new hyperboles, even, it may be, the unconditioned. Or perhaps, in the very first words, unhesitatingly and confidently, convinced and convincingly, dynamically and powerfully, they may say, God. Either way, however, they dare to speak about God. And he goes on from here to talk about um, the making statements which demand faith, making assertions about final truth, presenting a thou to hearers that they had not encountered before. And so this is how Bart conceives of the task of speaking about God. And so he ends talk, he's talked about theologians there through that long quote. That's at the top of page 46. The, the paragraph that begins further down dives right in on preachers. And he's making essentially the same point uh, there. So minimal distinction between being a theologian and being a preacher. In each case, you're venturing, you're daring to speak of God, you're making self-involving uh, claims, you're encountering an other. And this thou, uh, we can dig in a little more. Uh, Bart really underscores the idea that God is external to or independent of 
uh, is not entirely consistent because, of course, we can make a distinction there between something being external to and independent of. But he's trying to secure uh, God's self-determination beyond the subjectivity of the human person. So, in other words, Bart is uh, underscoring that God has an objective reality, uh, but that objective reality is non-objectifiable. And again, non-objectifiability, a key point in dialectical theology. So, uh, there's a, a quote that I'll read to you um, going from the bottom of page 48 to the top of page 49 that underscores this non-objectifiability, the idea that God has a certain kind of objective reality but is not one object among others. So, Bart begins with, a, with an exclamation, Problems to the right of us and problems to the left of us. Have I really posited God as the object if my experience as the subject supposedly real and given is the only basis of this positing? Is not the God who is posited thus something other and smaller than God himself, one object among others, a part of the world, no matter how inconceivable or exalted? Conversely, have I posited myself as the subject when the categories in which my supposed experience is described are taken seriously and can thus be regarded as an adequate reason for positing God? Or does not this way of positing myself, this is particularly plain in Heim, shatter any real concept of the true and given human subject? So he's riffing here on some of his contemporaries and guiding lights in the German liberal tradition, underscoring the way that they... Uh, do not maintain the non-objectifiability of God, the way that they uh, reduce God into a certain kind of pious subjectivity. Uh, but Bart rejects this. He talks about uh, a rejection of so-called worldview, language that is very popular in certain as uh, realms of the United States Church uh, today. And he makes the really important point toward the bottom of page 49, that God's relationship to everything that is not God is non-competitive. And this is a point that Bart makes uh, throughout the rest of his career. It's a really important conceptual tool uh, in his uh, theological toolbox. So I'm going to read this quote for you uh, from the bottom of 49. But when we really know God, we know that he is above all gods, that he cannot be confused or equated with any that he is not in competition with the greatest or the smallest things that are called divine in nature or history or culture or civilization. How lonely are those who dare to speak about God, how far removed from the broad way of the many or even the quiet paths of the finest and noblest among us. End the quote. So, whereas all these other approaches identify God with something in the world, they objectify God, uh, they connect the true God with one of these false gods, with an idol, as it were, Bart says, when you really know God, you realize that that is not the way that it is. God is not in competition with those things, which is another way of saying that God resides in a completely different level than these other small g gods that we might point to in culture, in uh, rationality, in history, and so on. So then he moves on page 50 to address the need for disruption, given that God is beyond all of these other things that we call gods, or we might call God, uh, God has to break in to our conceptual world and disrupt it. So he talks about the great divine dis disruption to which alone we may attach our hope. So it all depends on God showing up and disrupting us. And then he raises the important question at the end of this first subsection on page 51 of by what right do people have, uh, do people speak of God? What authorizes this? And that moves him into the second subsection on the permission and command to preach. And this is a really interesting subsection because it goes against um, some of the prevailing ways of reading Bart in uh, the United States and English language theology today. Specifically, it tells against kind of a post-liberal reading of Bart, which turns Bart into a theologian concerned with uh, liturgy and with church tradition and culture and so on. And Bart's addressing uh, the place of the church relative to scripture in the permission and command to, to preach. And on page 53, he says something that I think is, is very telling. He says, to be sure the church is there. 
This is what we must say first. The venture of Christian preaching is the venture of the Christian church. I'll stop quoting there. The church is there. like It's part of the story, but this is just clearing his throat. Uh, this doesn't really carry much uh, theological weight for him. The church is there just as a material condition. It just happens to be the case. Uh, you have to have Christians present. Whenever you've got a group of Christians, you've got the church. Arguably, whenever you've got a single Christian, you've got the church. So the church is there, and, but you can hear the but coming. Sure, the church is there, but. And that but for Bart is scripture. And here he's really channeling Calvin in the way that Calvin articulates from the Reformed Protestant perspective the priority of scripture over the church. Calvin works this out in conversation with Augustine. But Bart's Bart's not digging in that deep to the uh, history of it. But he talks about the church as a, or of scripture as a historical datum, as a canon, as a definite sphere or of activity or responsibility for those who would speak of God. And then he says, The claim that such and such writings are the canon meant that the church found its marching orders and working direction in these writings. By the presence of these writings, and at the very first, partly by the oral proclamation of their authors, it felt itself enlisted in their hosts. The monuments of witness of departed prophets and apostles were for it a command not to leave their places empty. End quote. I just love that line. The monuments of the witness of departed prophets and apostles that uh, grabs hold of you and convinces you that somebody needs to take the place of these prophets and apostles who have departed and carry on the trajectory of their witness. So this is ultimately what authorizes and commands or what gives permission and command to preach, to speak of God uh, for Bart. It's not tradition, it's not liturgy, uh, it's not the church culture as such, it's encounter with the monuments of the witness of the prophets and departed prophets and apostles. And this leads Bart into an extended discussion of the scripture principle, although he does not explicitly call it that, as far as I've been able to identify here, uh, but it's really what he's talking about. And ultimately, this is an explanation for why Bart is a reformed theologian, as opposed to some other kind of Protestant. So, uh, I'm going to read a long quote here uh, on page 54 uh, to the top of 55. Uh, The long and short of this quote is that the permission and command to preach ultimately comes from Scripture. We must speak of God because we hear Scripture speak of God, and it produces a kind of echo uh, as an image that Bart often uses. So here's the long quote. We might illustrate this impression by an example that is very dear to me, namely by the strange processes that led especially to the formation of the Reformed churches in the 16th century. I call them strange because the most positive impulse accompanying the many negative, and from a Christian standpoint, very dubious things that were also at work, was to us the amazingly passionate rediscovery, acknowledgement, and assertion of the ancient canonical literature. Because in a way that was acute, sudden, and revolutionary, the Bible again became the marching orders and direction to preach. Because it was understood as the canon not merely in the critical sense, but also in the imperative sense. In this field, the ancient book, and much more distinctly than, than in the Luther Reform, Lutheran Reformation, the book itself, the whole Bible, and not just a specific truth in the Bible, as in the case of Luther, commanded with an almost uncanny dynamic a new attention, respect, and obedience. To a degree and with an intensity that are almost intolerable to us today, people had to speak again about God in the light of this historical datum as though it could be done and had never been attempted before. Read some of the sermons of Calvin with this in mind. How this man is grasped and stilled and claimed. Not too quickly must one suppose by his experience of conversion, or by the thought of predestination, or by Christ, or even, as is commonly said, by passion for God's glory. No, but in the first instance, simply by the authority of the biblical books, which year by year he never tired of expounding systematically down to the very last verse. 
how this man, moving always along the uncrossable wall of this authority, copying down what he finds copied there, as if the living words of God were heard there, becomes himself holy voice and speech and persuasion, and can never exhaust or empty himself, as though nothing were more self-evident than this torrential talk about God, in spite of all the objections which might be urged against it, and which he himself knew well enough. Why was this? In the first instance, we can find no other reason than this. Because he heard Moses, Jeremiah, and Paul speak about God. Because he heard there the trumpet that summoned him to battle. In something of the same way, 1400 years earlier, in the historically obscure early period when the old book was not yet old, the oral and written witness of the same prophets and apostles affected the people of the second generation and brought about the rise of the early church, that is, the rise of Christian preaching. End quote. In typical Bart form, uh, he needs to caution us about how we understand the relationship between these monuments of the witness of departed prophets and apostles, between the words in Scripture and the Deus Dixit itself, the word capital W of God itself. And on page 56, Bart says that uh, Scripture is a paradoxical form of God's word, a paradoxical form of God's word. In other words, there is not a simple identity between the words of Scripture and the word, capital W, of God. Not a simple identity. There's a kind of paradoxical identity here, to use language that I've used in the past, uh, drawing from Rudolf Bultmann. There's a paradoxical identity. And the way that that Bart uh, articulates this is compelling, I think, because he, he draws the contrast between the Deus Dixit, the God speaks, and the Paulus Dixit, the Paul speaks, as kind of a symbolic way of referring to the words of Scripture as a whole. And Barth says, the older Protestantism was well aware of this distinction. And by older Protestantism, Barth means uh, the P- Reformational period prior to um, the modern development of scholasticism, so uh, prior to the Enlightenment prior to uh, the urge to turn the Bible into a paper pope, as it were. The older Protestantism was well aware of this distinction. It did not simply equate the Deus Dixit with the Paulus Dixit. Although it recognized God's word fully and unconditionally in the Paulus Dixit, but even though it recognized it, it did not simply equate the Deus Dixit with the Paulus Dixit. And uh, in articulating uh, this claim, Barth makes appeal to Heinrich Bullinger, uh, Peter Martyr Vermeule, Calvin, and others to to, uh, demonstrate that he's got his facts right here about how they thought about Scripture. He does it really quickly, but uh, you can tell he's reading from Hepe if you watch uh, the footnotes, Hepe, the Compendium of Reformed Theology. Uh, And he also appeals to to some um, Christological concepts to help articulate what he means by this paradoxical form of relationship between the Deus Dixit and the Paulus Dixit. He speaks of the agraphon and engraphon, the word agraphon, the word uh, unwritten and the word written, uh, between the inner word to the apostles and the outer word of the apostles. That's his language. And this ties in later uh, with his thinking about uh, the anhypostasis and enhypostasis in Christology, or or the um, logos asarkos and the logos ensarkos. Uh, he's using the same dynamic in an incipient way. It's not fully developed, but he's using the same incarnational dynamic to describe the relationship between the Deus Dixit and the Paulus Dixit. And then this is where he sort of ends the conversation. Insofar as it still knew and utilized this distinction, the older Protestantism still understood the definition of Scripture as God's Word, or of God as its author, is a strictly paradoxical one and must always remain so. Revelation gives rise to Scripture and itself speaks in it. This is what makes Scripture God's Word without ceasing to be historically no more than the words of the prophets and apostles, sharing the relativity, the ambiguity, and the distance that are proper to everything historical. The letters and words are flesh. 
end quote. Hugely important. So uh, despite all of the work to use an incarnational analogy to tie together the Paulus Dixit and the Deus Dixit, nonetheless the paradoxical distinction uh, has to be maintained. And he says it always remains paradoxical. At no point is this resolved in any kind of a permanent way. There is only the encounter with the Deus Dixit in the Paulus Dixit uh, in, in the event of faith. So hugely important uh, in in uh, incipient form for Barth's later development of his doctrine of scripture, especially in Church Dogmatics 1-2, uh, where he will famously say the being of scripture is in its becoming as it, the Deus Dixit continues to inhabit and encounter us by way of the Paulus Dixit. And that finishes up the second subsection here, and we move on to the third subsection, the meaning of Deus Dixit. And uh, Bart articulates six points here to underscore the meaning of Deus Dixit. The first point is that Deus Dixit means an address. So God uh, communicates God's self. There's an I-thou encounter here that's central uh, to the speaking of God. To receive revelation is to be addressed by God, Bart says. And then the second point is that a deus dixit means disclosure in the sense of apocalypse and revelation. It's a becoming open uh, to God and God's speech. And so he reiterates the paradox of scripture here and uh, what happened as that paradox was lost. And so I'm going to read you another decent chunk here. And as opposed to what he said earlier about the older Protestantism, now he's going to talk about later Protestant orthodoxy. So here's what he has to say. Later Protestant orthodoxy did incalculable damage with its doctrine of inspiration, in which it did not accept the paradox that in Scripture God's word is given to us in the concealment of true and authentic human words, when it removed the salutary barrier between Scripture and Revelation, when it adopted pagan ideas and made the authors of the Bible into amanuenses, pens, or flutes of the Holy Spirit, and thus found in the Bible an open and directly given revelation, as though this were not a contradiction in terms. Long before the Enlightenment, this meant no more and no less than a pitiful historicizing of revelation, which then continued if in another form. To deny the hiddenness of revelation even in Scripture is to deny revelation itself, and with it the Word of God. End quote. So again, the paradox being absolutely essential, and as soon as you resolve the paradox away, you've turned uh, the living words of Scripture into a form of idolatry. You've objectified it uh, unhelpfully. So that's the second point. It's a disclosure. Deus Dixit means disclosure, apocalypse, revelation. Number three, point three, Deus Dixit means a here and now. Bart talks about an eternal perfect. And uh, basically what he's getting at here is we're not talking about some kind of general speaking of God. We're talking about particular contingent events of God's speech that then have relevance at a universal level. So the particular universal, as it were, as opposed to some kind of um, non-particular general universal. And so uh, there's a quote here on page 60 that I'll read to you to underscore this. The view that the whole world or anything within it is revelation conflicts with this Deus Dixit. Even the general truths of reason, for example, mathematical axioms, are not what is meant by it, nor is their manifestation and perception as though revelation were only the symbol of something that is latently and potentially present and given, even if in a higher sphere. If we were to call revelation a symbol, it would have to be the symbol of the truth which is nowhere, and never the truth, except in itself." So again, non-objectifiable. The speech of God is not identical to anything in this world. Uh, and, and God is not to be equated with any feature in the world, even with mathematical axioms. And that leads him to point number four. Deus Dixit means qualified history. Qualified history. It's non-objectifiable in history. 
just as it is non-objectifiable at the conceptual level. So you cannot point to things in history and say here, in a non-paradoxical way, is God's speech. And here again, it is non-competitive with history. Uh, you don't have to identify certain aspects of history that are 100% uh, instances of divine activity and nothing else, or uh, instances of human activity and nothing else, because these two kinds of activity exist on different levels and can interact in ways that do not compete with each other. Uh, so you can describe things by multiple different perspectives, but you always have to maintain the distinction, and the relationship is always paradoxical and cannot be resolved into a permanent feature because that is to objectify it. So you can't, just like you can't climb up a conceptual ladder to God's revelation, so you cannot climb up an historical ladder to God's revelation. And this, of course, has a lot, and Bart doesn't get into it here, but this, of course, has a lot of relevance to thinking about uh, Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And we get lots of folks today and they have been for a long time talking about how you can demonstrate the truth of the resurrection on historical grounds. And Bart is just entirely uninterested in that, even if you could demonstrate it on historical grounds, as far as Bart is concerned, that wouldn't actually give you access to God or revelation any more than uh, not being able to prove it on historical grounds. It's simply beside the point. So then point number five is that God is the subject of revelation. God always remains subject of revelation, even in the revealedness. Otherwise, you're not dealing with revelation, you're dealing with idolatry. And here again, we see Cal or Barth's reformed theological credentials coming through. Uh, idolatry is a great concern in the Reformed tradition. Calvin had a lot to say about idolatry. In fact, Calvin called uh, fallen sinful human nature an idol factory because of the way that human beings continually create idols to worship and objectify God in different ways. And so there's a quote here that goes from the bottom of 61 to the top of 62 that I'll read to you because it gets at this and it's an important point. Only revelation in the strict sense overcomes the dilemma which haunts all religious philosophy, namely that the object escapes or transcends the subject. Revelation means the knowledge of God through God and from God. It means that the object becomes the subject. It is not our own work if we receive God's address, if we know God in faith. It is God's work in us. Our own work either breaks down here or it succeeds and the result is an idol. But revelation means that God's work is done in us whose own work would necessarily end either one way or the other. The modern locating of revelation in feeling or experience, or what is called inwardness, is so terrible just because, in relation to God, it ascribes to us an organ and the use of an organ, which is ours apart from God, just because it makes God an object without God, and in so doing it denies revelation, in which the Deus Dixit never ceases to be Deus Dixit, even when we believe, even when we think we feel and experience it, even when we try to speak about God. God always remains subject, the one who speaks, even when we are trying to speak about God. Again, uh, it's that paradox that cannot be resolved into a feature of our world. And sixth and finally, Deus Dixit means word and knowledge, not only experience or emotion, but the, Bart doesn't want to exclude these things altogether, but he wants to set up a priority relationship where knowledge is fundamental and the other things then come later. So he says right at the end of the section, when we pass through this narrow gate of speaking and hearing, in other words, interacting with the revelation of God as word, when we pass through this narrow gate of speaking and hearing, other things become possible and necessary as well as speaking and hearing. I do not dispute this but not before. And we are speaking about the narrow gate where it all begins when we are speaking about revelation. Here we must insist on the Deus Dixit, the word, the logos, is revelation. So all of the emotion and the experience comes in, but it's not the first thing. And the first thing to get it all off the ground is word, logos, revelation, the Deus Dixit, the God speaking. Then the final section is on the situation of 
preachers. And Bart begins with a bit of a recapitulation of everything he's been saying about being addressed by God, about God disclosing God's self and God's hiddenness, about the prophets and the apostles and the monuments of their witness and so on. Uh, but then he gets into the preacher's situation uh, more properly. And I want to highlight this for you. And it's another longer quote, uh, so forgive me, but we're going from the bottom of 63 into 64. Do not set yourself in the sphere of the Christian church. Do not bother about the church's reference to the Bible or the Bible's reference to the Deus Dixit, as is always the privilege of even Christian theologians. And lo, it is easy to talk about God. The matter becomes feather light once you are freed from the fatal Deus Dixit. In the depths of our own soul or the national soul or the world's soul, you can now find something that your heart can truly experience, that you can call your God, and that you can talk about because you know it really and surely and non-paradoxically. So it's just as a sidebar. This is Bart describing the process of objectification. There is now a serious or joyful reason to take courage for this task. Vigorously ventured, why should it not be as possible as any other? Surely, too, you can now find somewhere a valid vocation, fulfilling an inner drive or proclaiming an ideal truth or offering kindly service to your neighbors or simply serving as an official in charge of this matter. If there is some other permission and command for speaking about God apart from the Christian permission and command, and those who pass by the latter will have to say this, and it is to be hoped prove it, then happy are those who find it, for they escape all the worries that we spoke about at the beginning of this section, and they can be quiet pastors who never bring disquiet to anyone. On their own responsibility they may go their way in peace. Regarding the Christian permission and command, however, we have to say to those who choose it, or who at least partially rely on it too, and who would not, that when it is given to us, it plunges us into the press of anxieties and questions and never leads us out again. A press of anxieties and questions. So the idea that if you want a peaceful life, turn away from the Deus Dixit, but those who encounter the Deus Dixit, who encounter the God of the Gospel, are cast into anxiety. Not particularly encouraging uh, and not particularly uh, helpful for those who are anxiety-ridden, who are faced with this task of having encountered God, what then do you say? But Bart is trying to draw a stark contrast here between the situation of those who are encountered and the situation of those who are not. And to say that uh, for those who have encountered God in this way, these other strategies will not work. You cannot simply objectify God and hope that God will go away. You cannot simply hide God under a bushel, as it were, and hope that the light will dim. Bart says, moving on, the very opposite is the case. If we had to do only with the world, apart from the bit of bother that is bound up with any job, we should be mostly at peace, quickly assisted by a little apologetics, routine, and sense of duty. The world does not know what real doubts are, real collapse, really being at one's wit's end, real destructive criticism. But when we follow the Christian permission and command to talk about God, we have to do with God, or more precisely, we have to do with the word of God and his revelation, with the Deus Dixit. It is the Deus Dixit that puts us in that exposed position. And I just love what Bart's getting at here with this idea that um, if you hadn't encountered God, you can use some of these uh, adjustment strategies and have a perfectly comfortable life. Uh, we have this uh, phrase today in the United States uh, for those who undergo psychological treatment, uh, trying to become well-adjusted. That's the phrase, become a well-adjusted person, a well-adjusted human being, somebody who's able to function in society. But who wants to be well-adjusted to certain things? It's like saying that if you're walking through a war zone, you need to become well-adjusted to seeing the horrors and atrocities there so that they don't bother you. But ultimately, you lose something of your humanity in becoming quote-unquote well-adjusted. The same is true in our society today. The same is true in Barth's time. There are things that we want to become well-adjusted to because otherwise we live with a great deal of anxiety and frustration. But to become well-adjusted to them would be to lose something important about our humanity. So when Barth's talking about uh, if, if you only had to do with the world, what's out there apart from God, uh, you might be a little annoyed by your job, but everything would be all right. I can't help but read on the underside of this uh, a criticism of Barth's uh, own bourgeois milieu in the German context in the early 20th century. 
Uh, Bart understands, coming from Soffenville and his organization with workers there, Bart understands that this is not true for everybody. That not everybody just has a little bit of bother with their job and is otherwise comfortable. Bart knows that far too well. We cannot help, I can't help but read this line as deeply sarcastic and critical of bourgeois uh, participation in the world and bourgeois expectations about what life in the world should be. And Bart is saying that if you are encountered by the deus dixit, all of that kind of bourgeois self-satisfaction goes right out the window. And instead, you have to deal with anxiety. That is real destructive criticism. It cuts to the heart of your way of life and your expectations for what that way of life should be for the comfort and ease and respectability of that way of life. So I'm going to jump ahead a bit now to page 67 to address a quote here because Bart has now uh, reiterated the anxiety that should accompany encounter with the Deus Dixit. And he needs to find some way to speak peace to that anxiety, or at least articulate how it is that anxiety is to be born in this encounter with God. So he says on page 67, To be real, our certainty about God must always lie in God's hands. Those who wait upon God, or those who have found certainty in themselves, will get new strength and mount up with wings as eagles. To believe is to be content to wait, to know that assurance is hidden securely in God, which is infinitely better than having it in ourselves. Deus Dixit is our confidence, not experience. Deus Dixit is our confidence, not experience. We can only believe. We can only believe even that our faith is true faith. The righteousness of faith is God's righteousness. And that quote. So what Bart's speaking about here is the way encounter with God in the Deus Dixit is a radical decentering of human life, and it re- decenters it precisely so that it can be recentered in Christ. So yes, there's a great deal of anxiety produced by encounter with the Deus Dixit. It puts us ill at ease in a world gone awry. It uh, prevents us from becoming well adjusted to the problems of that world. So yes, it produces a great deal of anxiety by decentering us, by taking away from us the opportunity to create our own meaning. In, uh, in contrast, we have to find meaning then in God, in this encounter with the Deus Dixit. And so rather than being centered in ourselves, we are recentered externally in the God who speaks, in the God who disrupts. So this is the existential heart of dialectical theology, a radical uncertainty that goes along with a radical openness and being decentered and placed entirely in God's hands. So this is not seeking false security in theological, liturgical, traditional, cultural idols or objectifications. Instead, it's seeking security only in God who is with human beings, in the witness to God's self. And this is how Bart ends the section, by talking about the Holy Spirit, about God being present in human life. And this is page 68. The very reference to the Holy Spirit, that is, to God himself in the present, in the church, and in us, is also a reminder that we have something neither to be experienced nor to be thought, nor, the third possibility, to be asserted. That God himself bears witness to himself. That he does so, not the heart, is what makes a theologian. And then going off script for a minute, that he does so, that God does this, that God encounters us with the Deus Dixit in the Holy Spirit with us, is what uh, provides Christians and people of faith with the courage to be, as Paul Tillich put it, and the courage to move forward in a world that needs to be ever more disrupted by the speech of God. You've been listening to the McCracken Cast. I am and hopefully will remain Dr. Travis McMacken. I do all the production work myself, in case you couldn't tell, but the music is by my son Connor. Until next time, think interesting thoughts. Mm-hmm.